Aperture. So I'm going to go ahead and start the, uh, the conversation with an introduction of my work, and then um, Vivian and I will get into details and all that. Uh, first, I'm going to show a video, and, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about my work. Chicanos and Chicanas and people of color experience many things in life and make history, yet most of the time get unnoticed or misrepresented. But the Nanas and Lucas is not just an Instagram account, it's a digital archive that documents the Chicano or Latino youth culture in Southern California. The Tiranas and Rucas started out of an urgency to reconnect with family and my community that I had left behind. If I Google searched my experiences as a teenager, what would I look for? Unfortunately, I wasn't finding anything online. I wanted to read and look at images of brown bodies at backyard parties cruising the boulevard. I began to understand the body as archives, bodies that documented memories and trauma. I wasn't looking for fashion images, male-dominated images. I was looking for something more intimate, but that was, that was my struggle, being away from my, from my community, yet wanting to feel really close. The Instagram served as a way to reframe our history. When I started posting my own photos and these photos from Street Beat Magazine, people started submitting their own. So what I'm trying to do here is create a platform where people share their stories the way they want to share them. Whatever uh, photo they find empowering, people that they miss, you know, whether it's a relative or a loved one. Uh, Slide it in the DM. Okay, let me open one that was just sent two minutes ago. Cuba homegirl, I just wanted to show you a couple of flicas of my tia's homegirls from Pacoima Flex, the tiny locas. Left is Chata, and on the right is La Chica, 1979. In some sense, I feel like an archivist. I love taking care of the material that people submit or bring to my studio. It's a labor of love, and these things are precious to me. I, I need to have this material that is proof that this history existed. Me too. Thank you. So um, I'm going to go back to how I started the project. And um, in 2015, I started Veteranas and Rucas. I was living in New York. I had left LA in, in 2000. Um, I was 20. I, I left after a lot of things started to change, you know, like um, when I grew up in LA, it was, you know, it was really fun. Uh, I had like these really close friends, friendships and I hung out with my sister a lot. Uh, we, um, we, we did a lot of good things, a lot of fun things, a lot of things that teenagers do. And then uh, in 1996, my cousin was killed due to gang violence. Um, after that, my, like, my life changed a lot. And so for like those four years from between 1996 through like 99, 2000, um, I started to think about how like something needed to shift in my life. And then um, I made this decision to leave LA. You know, like I actually had never traveled outside of LA. My world was, you know, pretty much like my block. So I left, I left LA in 2000. And when I left, I pretty much disconnected myself from my family, friends, and everything in LA. And pretty much wanted to like start this new, new life in New York. So then I, you know, I, I grew up, I, I started missing home. I started realizing that, that my family and my friends were really important in LA and I started missing them a lot. And what I did was I was using the internet to, to like reconnect and learn what was going on in LA because I still wasn't talking to anyone in LA. Um, and I started, you know, doing my own research on like my own history. Uh, there wasn't a lot that I can like relate to. 
especially like coming from like a female perspective or a woman's perspective, it was like pretty like stereotypical what I was finding online. And also like from like a male perspective. So that's what inspired me to start Veteranas and Rucas. And um, so I started with images similar to, the, these, are, these are mine actually, but I started posting my own photos. And these photos were taken at, at like a local mall or at one, like a one hour photo. And um, these photos that you see here are like, pretty much like we would treat them like trading cards back, back in the 90s. We would write a note in the back and then we'll give them to our friends. And uh, we'll just like pass, pass, pass them in like high school or, or like our best friends and stuff. Um, and that's me on the left with my friend um, at a house party. I look very different. <laughs> um, and then I started asking people to submit their own photos. And the reason why I did this was because I also wanted to hear other people's stories and, and, and connect and also relate to their stories and photographs. I posted this photo in, I think it was this year. No, last year, actually. And the reason why I wanted to show this photo is because a lot of people were questioning this photograph. You know, they were like, this photo is not from 1992. This is from yesterday or something. <laughs> and um, a lot of people, I mean, there was like the conversation. That's another thing that I'd like to mention about Instagram that's so important is that, you know, like the photograph may start a, com a conversation, but also the comments are, are, are a big part of this project because people learn, people reconnect, and people argue. <laughs> so um, what happened with this photo, a lot of people were saying, you know, this photo is not from 1992, but then other people will be like, yeah, it is because I went to high school with them. So, you know, then... Um, and then people will talk about the fashion, you know, like, yeah, those shoes don't exist anymore, <laughs> or things like that. And this photo is a photo that's featured on the cover of Aperture. This photo was submitted in 2017 by the woman on the left, her daughter. And uh, the two women are from East L.A. and Boyle Heights. This is another photo that's also in the magazine, um, also submitted by the woman's daughter. And what's nice about this photograph is that this photo actually was in, the woman had this photo in storage for like, I don't even know, like 30 years. And her daughter went to the storage and took out this photo and submitted the photo. So then now, um, having this photo in the magazine is really, you know, like the, the woman in the photo, she, she's very, very grateful because she felt like at some point she was probably going to throw this photo out, you know. So um, in a way that, like, I guess bringing it back to the work that I'm doing, it is about, um, like, self-preservation and, and empowering other, other women to not so much like take care of their photographs, but also like reflect back on the history and appreciate um, their upbringings and, and material. I started uh, Map Points in 2016. And um, Map Points is mostly, it, it's, it's, wow. Um, it's focused on the party scene and rave scene in the 90s in Southern California. So Veteranas and Rucas is focused on women um, and like the history in LA. And Map Points is boys and girls from the party scene. Um, and I wanted to show this photo because it's a good example of how like the youth created, you know, like these like safe spaces. And we pretty much obviously used whatever we could. Uh, we had like two shopping carts as a DJ booth. And um, as you can see, <laughs> uh, this photo was taken out on the street at a party, outside a party. And um, I wanted to show this photo because a lot of these images were photos that 
women didn't want to show, you know, like a lot of, like, they were going to either throw them out or they weren't ready to show them. And these photos, especially this one, comes from a woman, you know, like a lot, for many years. Um, I mean, even, even now, you know, like women still get like slut shamed or called names or whatever. Um, so the work, the Instagram is, it is about um, owning, you know, like, like being like, like being almost like proud that they, ex they experienced something like, you know, like the party scene and not being um, embarrassed about it. This is a party, it's a, um, a ditching party in East LA. Probably like at eight o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday or something. <laughs> There's another photograph taken at a party um, in Boyle Heights, 92, I think. Also, this photo here, um, the guy who took this photo, his name is Eddie. He had all these photos in, a, in his storage, and a lot of them got water damaged. And these are some of the ones that, that were saved. Um, the reason why... These photos were, or like the ones that he damaged were because um, his mom had kicked him out back in like 93 and threw all his stuff out on the street. And it was raining that night. So he went back home and he saw the stuff on the street and he picked up whatever he could. Uh, I can show you those in a bit. Matt points, I also post photo, uh, you know, like uh, flyers. These, these flyers were the, the flyers that were passed around at parties or at school to promote uh, an event. So now the Instagram has become a project bigger than just uh, on, on Instagram. It's also become a, a, like a physical archive. So this is one of the photos that I was just mentioning. Um, all this stuff that you see on the on the on the prints, it's all water damage. And this photo was taken in around the alley riots. And this woman's putting a sign on her on her store, Mexican owned, so it wouldn't get destroyed. And these are just shots from the archive. Uh, I was given a photo album. And the stuff that you see up there, all those notes, those are directions to parties before <laughs> Google Maps. <laughs> so it says, make a right on Gage, make a left on Pacific, make a right. <laughs> I also have hoochie shorts in the archive. <laughs> It says playful teasers. <laughs> and now I'm also organizing lowrider car shows. I was supposed to have something here, but unfortunately it's raining, so we couldn't do that. Maybe another time. And this is the show I just had last weekend in, in LA. I had about 50 cars outside of the museum. I'm not sure if you guys can see this, but I made this wallpaper in the show in LA, and um, it's all women socializing all over LA, and this was a, a way to, I, you know, I, I titled it um, Latinas Mapping Los Angeles, because, you know, it's like we, we are LA, and this is us enjoying LA or, or socializing in LA. Different parts of, you know, San Gabriel Valley, you have Sunset and Silver Lake, um, and then Whittier Boulevard. You can't really see it because it's dark. And these are shots from the show, the same show in L.A. I made these go-go boxes because um, the reason why I make these go-go boxes is because I wanted to sort of remove myself from like using 
um, traditional like display cases. So I was really inspired to like make my, my display cases look like go-go boxes instead. And um, the show that I had a few months ago, I asked people to participate in a way that they were also contributing to the show. So right here you see, um, I don't know if you guys can see that Tide box right there. That's actually a, a, a box that was converted, was made into a backpack. So it was uh, this raver girl that I met and she did this whole display. That's, that box is from 1994. Mm -hmm and her tapes and glow sticks and all that stuff. And that's a detail shot from the show. And I always have an altar for my cousin, and there's one here. Um, and just to like honor his life and death. And then back to this photo. Um, back to the physical, you know, bringing this, it's almost like this full circle. And I'll end it there for now. Thank you. Um, there are a few more seats in the front if people who need seats want to come sit. Lupe, thank you for being here with me. Congrats on the show. Congrats on Vincent Price. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm glad you brought it back to this image because um, it's, it's something I wanted to start with. First, I wanted to shout out um, Caribbean Fragosa, who is um, the person who wrote the, the essay for the Aperture publication. And it's a really, really beautiful text. Um, and I love how she kind of draws out the relationship between this work and um, a notion by Jose Esteban Muñoz of um, the ephemeral as evidence and the, the notion that a number of us who are erased and classed and queer um, have had to find kind of alternative ways to um, hold on to our transient realities either because we've decided to make them as, as such, but you know, party spaces, cruising spaces, and um, how because they, they kind of have that ephemeral quality, they're not given the same kind of historical significance or historical weight. They're not considered like official in the way that um, non-vernacular, like sort of more traditional professional um, photography and other forms are seen. Um, but what's really striking about this is that this image, um, you know, is from 1971. As much as Veteranas en Rucas and Map Points is known as kind of like a 1990s um, centered project, and it's very much a lot of the aesthetic. Um, there are ways in which like the image of Alma and um, other images are pointing to kind of like this temporal um, loop and the like historical legacy of this so that people are also submitting stuff from earlier generations. So I wanted to know if you wanted to talk a little bit about how that space has also opened up to some of that more historical reflection. Yeah, um, I know that like both you know, projects are mostly focused on the 90s but I also want to highlight like the history before the 90s because like I always think that even now like in, in order to understand the present we have to look back. It's the same thing with the 90s. In order to understand the 90s we have to look at the history before the 90s. Um, it's also a way for me to like understand the injustices that, that have been happening, you know, and that are happening now still. It's the same thing, you know, um, and and yeah, I mean, I, the the oldest photo that I've gotten for veteranos was probably like from the 1800s, you know. So it's like as long, you know, I don't know, like as long as uh, photography has existed, that's how far I'll go. So that's incredible. Um, <laughs> I have so many questions. Like, where to start? I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the vitrines in the show too, and talk a little bit about sort of the connections between. You know, this is a digital archive. This has like a digital form, but the connections between your work and something like Street Beat or Teen Angel, and how those publications were also somewhat submission-based. Like, people could submit drawings and like poems or whatever else. 
um, into those. And so, like, what is the connection you see yeah. to your work? So, if you guys see the show, there's some magazines that I have in the vitrines. Um, that was another, like, inspiration for the work, you know. Um, those magazines were self, like, self-published by, like, local, how would I say this? Um, the people that were making these magazines and, and writing for these magazines were teenagers. You know, like, Street Beat Magazine was a magazine that came out between 1990 and 1996. The editors, the writers, there were people who were writing for yearbooks, you know, um, graphic designers who were using their computer class to like design the magazine, you know. Um, and the photos that were featured in the magazine were mailed to the per to like the magazine and then they would get them back. So it's the same thing but that I'm doing, but it's all like much faster. <laughs> um, but it's, it's the same conversation, you know. And there's some pages that I have open in the vitrine. You guys can read what it says. There's a lot of stuff. You know, it's, it talks about fashion, but it also talks about um, Pete Wilson, for example. Yeah, so. can, you, can you tell people who that is? So Pete Wilson was someone we hated a lot. <laughs> <laughs> He uh, had Proposition 187, which was, um, <laughs> which meant that if you voted for 187, that meant that um, it would take away education, health care, any sort of benefits to illegal um, immigrants yeah. or immigrants. Yeah. So that was like a 1984 ballot initiative, and it targeted undocumented um, communities basically being barred from any kind of public service. Mm -hmm. So at the same time, like, I know that in other presentations you've shown this, like, hilarious and also, like, incredibly problematic and horrible, like, Fox News still messing up, still being a jerk. Fox News kind of undercover report on, like, these street parties and how, you know, framing it as, like, oh, these kids hate their, they don't care about their education and they're doing all these ditching parties, but how the public education system was a space that felt deeply alienating and also like a place to be criminalized, mm -hmm. another place where your identity was um, being policed. Yeah, I mean, I think about this a lot because I think about the law and like we had to break these laws in order to survive. Like that's how I saw it. We had to create these spaces. We had to have these parties, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> You know, like, we needed that to survive, you know. But in the way that, for example, Fox News, um, you, c you can find these videos on YouTube, by the way. And um, so Fox News would go to these, to these safe spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and the way they would go there was they would just show, like, hey, we're doing this, like, feature or, like, we're covering, um, like, the parties. Like, just something very, like, bland and basic. And, I mean, we were, like, 14 years old, 15 at the time. So we would get really excited about this, you know. And they would ask us questions, what the party meant for us and all that. But then we would, like... The way we were portrayed on TV was like these criminals, you know, like they're smoking weed, they're like not going to school, what do their parents think? Um, just really bad, you know. Um, and the white kids are also smoking weed. Yeah, and exactly. school and <laughs> drinking 40s. Right, yeah. yeah. So, um, and, and I know that that's been what made it really hard at the beginning of my work because a lot of people remember that, you know, they like remember how we were like shamed by being teenagers and you know like that's what like for my work like that's actually what I'm trying to do to like reframe and also um, like take back like what we like like own what we did you know and and also like understand it in a in a almost like celebrate and 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 um, and also like question Fox News like yeah. you know <laughs> Still, All that yeah. stuff, yeah. <laughs> um, could we go back to some of the images of the flyers? And there's a number also on view here. Um, but I don't know if, if maybe people who aren't familiar with the Map Points project, if you could describe a little bit um, what these phone numbers are for and what they signify in terms of... Yeah, like so it gets back to um, protecting our space and, and, and knowing who's invited and who's not. Uh, 
these flyers are from 95, 93. Uh, they're all from like the 90s. And, um, and around that time, I don't know if you guys can see these telephone numbers at the bottom. Uh, we had voicemails and what we would do was um, we would give directions to not to the part, not to the location of the party, but we had this like complicated way to get to the party where we would leave the directions to a map point, and the map point was like a gas station. So then, people will go to the gas station, pay the fee to the party, and then get like these little like directions, like the little map, and then caravan to the party. <laughs> Uh, and then we would delete or like re erase the voicemail. It would just be up for like an hour, and then um, so yeah, that's that's how we did the like yeah. how we organized. Yeah, and that keeps like police away and other people who you're not trying to have at your exactly. party. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, so in a way, I think that's like in a, a way to think like metaphorically or symbolically around and like preserving these histories, but also navigating the sort of co-optation and the ways that like our culture is at the same time that we, we gain more representation, more visibility, also are kind of like um, moving through spaces that are traditionally more institutional. Um, yeah, and trying to navigate some of that for yourself. So if you wanna share a little bit about your process in terms of like who you work with, how you work, um, and also Sorry, I'm, I'm throwing a lot of you at once. Um, but also, you know, the fact that like people are, are bringing their stuff to you and then online, uh, you do do like shout outs and credits of images to people, but then um, when you have an exhibition, you're kind of credited as like the artist and the images are courtesy of you. Um, so I'm wondering if you could share a little bit around like your mm -hmm. process in terms of um, either getting permission or building yeah, that sort of record of mm -hmm. who, who, who these people are and these images and whose stories they are. Yeah, so um, I had a show before the one and my, my recent show, and that was, I collaborated with, I can go back to, actually the guy that took this photo, Eddie. Um, where is it? Sorry, guys. Here we go. So... This photo, he, he actually took this in 92 in Boyle Heights, and this is one of the photos that, that got water damaged. And um, he was only showing me, like, the nice photos, you know, like, the ones that are really crisp and clean. And he said, you know, like, I have these other ones, but they're, like, they're, they're, I'm probably just going to throw them out. And um, he showed me this, this image, and I told him, like, if we don't have this photo, like, we don't have a story, you know? Um, and he like, he, we, you know, like I told him, what if we, we don't throw it out, we put it in a show, and it, it's more like, like, it's almost like giving it a second life, you know? So we printed this photo on this like really beautiful metallic paper, and we had it in the show, and it served as like this like altar, you know, because it was like, it was really beautiful, um, large print. And what I do is uh, I try to engage people in, in the shows, you know, whether it's like inviting car clubs, um, letting them know like when people donate material, I say to them, a lot of people actually are really shy and they don't want to like, they don't want me to mention their name, you know, especially when they um, give me yeah, stuff like this, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, but I... Um, I, yeah, like it's it's a, it's a conversation conversation that I have with people that donate. You know, like I, I let them know like this is how I want to use it, and do you want it back? You know, uh, a lot of people want to just give it to me, and they and they tell me you can do whatever you want. Um, also, the show here that I have here, it's going to be like this um, growing altar too. People are going to be leaving things here in the show, like like. It's just going to keep growing, and, and that's how I, I see each work that I have. You know, it's like um, very engaging in that way. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about um, the importance of altars and the way that you've brought that more into your work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, you know, I always think about the people that I lost through, 
you know, like in life, especially through gang violence. You know, like I, I experienced this when I was very young and I also lived it. So it's almost, it's a, uh, in a way to um, acknowledge, you know, it's, it's for me, it's also really important to, when I say celebrate, it doesn't mean just talk about the positive things. You know, it's also talking about the loss, um, trauma. Um, when I do these things, it's, it's also about healing. And uh, my cousin was really important to me. So, you know, even like the work that I'm doing is about understanding the death, you know, his like the murder of him or um, also like even like thinking about the erasure of of like our history too. you know, like when I was living in New York, L.A. was changing a lot. And I started thinking about where his body was found, where he was killed, and like how that is going to be erased one day. And it's still, and it's probably happening right now. And when I have an altar, it's it's like keeping that memory and and like his his presence almost. And I think that a lot of us can relate to losing someone that we love. And this is not just it, it is about him, but it's also connecting with others. Like, okay, this is also real, you know, like death is real and it happens. So. Yeah, and in a lot of communities of color, altar making can be something that's collective and a form of like collective mourning together. But I think um, elsewhere it's considered like a very private practice and it's something that is kept away from the public and bringing that sort of back into a more public space is, is super crucial. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about how much time we got. All right, great. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about like this project emerging out of your t being in New York and feeling like uh, Chicano culture wasn't something that was very legible here, and a, a more recent shift in that. I think there's like been more visibility of Chicano culture within a New York context. I think people are clearly very much um, wanting um, that engagement. They want to build that knowledge. There have been shows like Access Mundo that have traveled here. Um, yeah, how do you see that shift, like even coming back now and, and talking about your work and seeing how people understand it versus when you were first asking these questions and people are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, um, it was really different when I lived here. It was... <clears throat> I remember, you know, getting older, being aware of who I was, who I am, and also feeling um, culturally deprived because I was so far away from home. You know, like I, I was living in New York. I'd lived here for 15 years. And um, I remember like wanting to talk about certain things and then realizing that my friends couldn't really understand what I was talking about, you know. And uh, and that's actually like where you know like I would go to like the internet and try to find myself you know and, and but I think now it's different. I mean, I was just talking to a friend yesterday. She's a she's a dancer, and she was talking about how her work is about immigrant workers. She's from Guatemala, but like these weren't the conversations she was having or I was having with her five years ago. You know, so like things are definitely shifting, and that's good. Um, I'm sure that it's different now in New York, but I think that was also another part of my work. Like I just felt like so like like far away from my culture. What do you think is prompting the shift in terms of your friend feeling more empowered to do that work, or it's? Not that it's something you can pinpoint necessarily. Sorry, what was the question? No, I, you're saying that this is these were conversations you were having with your friend five years ago. Like, what do you think has been some of that shift? I mean, I think people in general, or you know, like there's a lot going on right now that, and I, I mean, especially with women. You know, I think women are like finding that bravery to speak out and like being like this is not okay you know and this and just and like this is also with the work that I'm doing you know um, people women are feeling um, I don't want to say safe or comfortable you know because I think like when people share 
something personal could be really hard, even if it's good. Like it's just, you know. Um, but like what I, what I'm noticing with the work that I'm doing is that a lot of women are feeling um, like almost like inspired to share their story, and and this is just like what I noticed in my work, you know. Um, I guess I, I want to mention something about like Instagram was that there's a, a page I don't know if you guys follow it but there's another page called Feed My Highness which means cool cool chicks mm -hmm. and that was a crew from from Inglewood in LA and this page was started after she, you know like the person that started the page she and I became really good friends and she felt really like she felt ready to talk about her experience in, in growing up in the 90s. And I remember like we were like sending each other private messages and she showed me this photo when she was 15. Um, she had been involved in a drive-by shooting and she was paralyzed for like a couple of years. She can walk now, but she showed me this photo where she had a scarf like down her torso. And she told me like, don't ever show this to anyone. And I, I never did, but like a few months ago, she posted this on Instagram and talked about her trauma and like who she is now. So that's another example of like what's happening, like things are shifting and, and I think it's a good time to do that. Um, and I mean, I, I always think about that photo, you know, like I remember her telling me that she would never show that photo to anyone and now she's talking about it. I mean, that's something that I think social media and the internet has kind of created that that openness for people. Um, I also, I mean, Veterana San Lucas, you've, you've mentioned today, um, is like a, a woman-centered kind of um, page. And I also am curious about, um, you've also elsewhere talked about how it's like also a space to talk about queer experience and that this community is also a queer community, that there are queer and trans people within this um, world, and that that might not be necessarily legible in the images that you share. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, how you're queering the archive through this work. Mm -hmm. It happens, I mean, with Veterana, it's really difficult. Um, but with Map Points, it's, the way I talk about it is through music and um, the party scene and, like, also talking about the club scene, who we were surrounded by, who, who we are now. Um, for example, I wish I had more photos with me, but um, there was this like really famous DJ, queer DJ, a uh, DJ Irene, and she was out, you know, and you know, like I, I, I put, you know, like I'll, I'll post a photo of her and talk about that and talk about how like the, these things didn't matter back then you know and it shouldn't matter now and occasionally it's it, and it sucks because it's like unfortunately like there's that one person who could be homophobic but when that happens is um a lot of people like jump in and and pretty much like call that person out you know i want to talk also about the physical archive, the fact that now people have, have entrusted you with photos and all kinds of ephemera. You have that sweatshirt up here. I'm sure you know you have chonies now. Like, what you, like what's this finding aid looking like? Like, what is this, um, what is the current reality of the physical material and what is like your, your possible vision for the future? So the archive, I, I, I didn't study to be an archivist. I just, it just it, it's happening and I'm learning. Um, I also do my own research. I, the people who help me are my friends, you know, who sometimes I'll like send them a text and be like, hey, my flyers are like all over the fucking mess. <laughs> Can you like help me, you know? So they come in and help me organize. Um, Ideally, I would love to have an archive space, not in my studio, but I just see this archive just growing, you know, and that is, I guess, my, my, my goal, to have a space where, a public space, where people can engage 
learn um on the east side yeah on the east yeah. side yeah <laughs> not culver city not, not <laughs> um yeah, like in East LA somewhere, yeah. you know. Yeah, no, yeah. that makes sense. Because we we talked about how at one point you were thinking about leaving some stuff with UCLA, and then thinking about wait, this is on the West Side. Who is UCLA a space like for? West like, Axis. who feels you know comfortable going to the archives there? Like, you know, what can you do with the Tonys in the archive? Like, <laughs> there's limits to what you can do in the, those kinds of spaces, and, and yeah, and also who has access to it too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, UCLA Chicano sort of definitely approached me to have material there, and I <clears throat> I declined that because I don't know, it just doesn't feel right to me, you know. Because then also, aside from being in an institution at UCLA and thinking about accessibility and who gets to go there, um, I also. Then the, the also the other thing is that they end up owning the material. Like I lose everything, you know. So that's something that I'm not interested in doing. Yeah, and it's the fact that you say, you know, I wasn't trained as an archivist, and now there's kind of like the prof professionalization of like archival work and of oral history work, and it's great that that's become something that is given that kind of, you know, legibility, authority, whatever, what have you, but. There's communities that have been doing that work forever who have been archived. We've been doing it forever, you know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, and keeping your stuff in whatever, whatever in a shoebox is as important as having your, your private art collection and, you know, your second home or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's time to open it up to questions from the audience. Sorry. Uh, Start th thank you so much for the work that you've done. It's amazing. Um, two questions. One, I wonder if you worked at all with um, Oliver Wang in the um, Legions of Boom, the Filipino um, South or Northern California um, Filipino DJ scene. No. No. Okay, we'll talk about it. Um, and then um, the one word I, I heard the words erasure and um, ephemera, but I didn't hear gentrification. So. I'm here in Brooklyn, and that's these communities are being erased. Um, I wonder how how you see gentrification and your work as a hedge against gentrification. Yeah, I mean, the work that I'm doing it has there's like so much about like it's not just like because I moved or because my cousin died or because you know like I'm thinking about so much stuff like because I moved away from home, I also saw how much my, my city was changing. And the work that I'm doing is, is, like, is a way of like preserving. It's like, you know, like doing the work, um, encouraging people to self-preserve, you know, like whether they want to give me the material, it's also like telling their own stories, you know, because we have to at some point. Um, it definitely affects, I mean, affects, if it affects me, if it affects my family, you know. Um, my mom, you know, like I grew up in Boyle Heights, moved to East LA, and I just kept going more east, you know. And then my, my, my mom lives like in Riverside, which is way east. So she's just getting pushed out like more and more and more. Um, so from like, my experience is, is, and also like with the work that I'm doing, it is about, um, like it was, it was like I had to do this kind of work because if I didn't, then things will get lost, material will get lost, stories will get erased. Uh, so yeah. Is it, I wanted to shout out the, that video project that you did, the town I live in, which is kind of like you kind of caught in the storm of like the boil Heights kind of art washing debate. Is that something you want to talk about? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that that's also like being wanting to be an artist. And you know, for me, being an artist is it's almost like this like spiritual practice for me. You know, and then going going back home, not knowing where to do that. You know, and then like 
like I still don't have an answer, you know. So um, I think it's like really, it, it is black and white, you know. So I'm still like thinking about that too. Yeah, but if you want it on Guadalupe's website, there's a section on film projects and there's this film that she did with Matt Wolf about kind of dealing with some of these issues and especially like the presence of new galleries and art spaces in that community and how artists who are originally from these areas are kind of interfacing and, you know, in the middle of that kind of debate. Go ahead, right here. Hi, hello, okay. Um, my cousin, she is a queer chola uh, her name's Rascal. The lights go on. Um, <laughs> it's like, the, right, hey, we're trolled. Here we go. The heavenly <laughs> shout out. <laughs> um, anyway, her name's Rascal, and I remember as a kid and growing up in the 90s, uh, she in particular dressed um, wearing a lot of men's clothing and jerseys and baggy pants and stuff, and even my other female cousins would wear men's clothing in a similar kind of way, even if they were straight or Sis, I mean, that wasn't language we ever, you know, used. <laughs> but um, do you think, I know you mentioned with veteranas that it's a little harder to express, like, the queer identity for women. Do you think that, um, you know, the baggy clothes and uh, women wearing menswear provided some sort of safe mode of, express, of expressing their, like, gender queer identity? Sorry, can you repeat that again? I was just wondering if you thought like chola clothing in terms of wearing like men's garments provided queer Chicanas an ability to express their queer identity um, at all. Yeah, I mean, I, rem I mean, the thing is uh, back, in, back in the like in the 90s, whether women were queer or not, they dressed masculine. And I always think about that, you know, like I think about how is someone identified as straight back in the day? Like, I would, like, this is something that I think about, like, men found that attractive, like a masculine woman, you know? And, um, but the thing that is hard is not the women, it's the men who are queer, you know, because they see, you know, people tend to be like, oh, it's a feminine or, you know, and, um, and it gets pretty heated in, in, you know, on Instagram, but I think it's necessary to have those conversations because, um, I mean, come on, it's 2018, <laughs> you know? So, and again, like, with Instagram, I don't like to censor anything. If there's, some, there's, if there's a conversation happening, it needs to happen, especially around queerness, especially around violence or whatever it is, you know? And if I see if it's a productive, that's a produ productive conversation or argument, then... I'll let that happen. But of course, I like, if it becomes something disrespectful, then that's when I, that's when I come in. We've got one back here. Hi, um, it's so great to be here. I'm originally from East LA as well. Um, born and raised uh, right by Cesar Chavez, Sunol, Whittier Boulevard, seeing all the quinceanera shops. So as you're talking about where to put your space, I know there's a lot of people in Boyle Heights that are demolishing, not demolishing, but um, like tagging up new uh, art studios that pop up because they're usually by like white people. So I'm all for you kind of being in that space and I'm sure you would have like community support, especially with this work that you have. But um, how... I was just back in LA and I saw how Whittier Boulevard's changed so much. There's like Nike stores and like corporatized big time. How do you think that us who are far away and don't have like, it's such a specific Mexican American or Hispanic American who lives in East LA, how did you find that here and how can we, what's your solution to creating those communities to kind of go back and do gentrification versus gentrification where we go back and, you know, it's, it's a term. I didn't make it up. I have a friend who, I don't know if it was from him, but gentrification <laughs> where we go back and build our communities from what we've, we've gained outside of them. Did other people know this term, gentrification? I love the word. Gentrification. Que la gente... 
La gente queda, oh, wow. la gente fica. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, wow. I love that. Thank you for that. Um, you know, when I was here, I didn't have a community, like a Latino community, you know, because I was hanging out with white queer artists and I had to go back home to identify. Um, what I did, what did happen here for me was I was able to come out as queer, something that I couldn't do in LA because I was, I was also like, I didn't have access to that. So, um, yeah, I don't, it's a kind of like a complicated question. <laughs> Can, do you want to, re is there something else that I can remember? With the communities that you found here, if you found any Latinx um, people from East LA, how do you encourage them to continue looking for their culture back home or to bring that back to East LA? And, and I know you have your work up near ELAC, but um, you know, building that community in there to, to invest within artists of the community. Mm -hmm. When I started the work, I was so like tough on myself and strict you know I was like I'm not gonna work with this person I'm not gonna do this it's like almost like self-made you know and um I don't know it's just it is it is hard you know like I it wasn't easy for me um you know like also like going back home I'm 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 able to find a queer community you know I'm, I'm able to like identify and be open about it um, damn, it's a tough one. Yeah, I don't know. I just read this piece. I think it was published like a couple of days ago by um, Raquel Gutierrez. I don't know if you've read it on Open Space, which is an online platform for SF MoMA, oh, right. and she's also an artist from East LA, and is kind of talking about like the fact that she had to leave LA also to like get her art education and to like um, develop like a queer identity and a queer community, and, the, and then going back you're kind of punished, like you're not well received when you return mm -hmm. to these spaces and you try um, to do art projects there or to have an art presence there. So I recommend reading it. I forgot what it was called. It was like something in the era of art washing, um, but it's up on open space right now and it's a, a good read. Thank yeah. you but so much, everyone. Let's give a round of applause to Vivian and Guadalupe.